Hey, Prentices, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Bruce from Printavo. We've got Mr. Stephen Farrag out of Campus Inc. and a very special guest, Lean Six Sigma certified Mr. Kevin Solomon. An awesome wealth of knowledge, especially with getting efficient just in the whole business. I was always thinking about production, but it's really the whole business, every single department and how to get everybody motivated. So and very excited about, oh, and? He's Eric Solomon's dad. So and we, yeah, he's leaking out all the secrets. Yeah, Eric from Solomon Night from Night Owl is dad. So it's a pretty awesome episode. But first, um, let's give it to our sponsors. We will uh, we'll start out with Supacolor. Supacolor is the world's best heat transfer. Supacolor is made using both digital and screen printing techniques. Why? Their digital process prints brilliant colors that make graphics pop backed up with screen printed white ink that gives amazing stretch and durability second to none. We use Supacolor a lot in our shop. We order it, it's super fast, it's super easy. And if you wanna use a promo code, you can use Printavo15 to get 15% off your order at Supacolor. Bruce? Make sure you use it, definitely awesome. Um, Yeah, they got some amazing technology that they're working on. We got a private tour there. Uh, check them out. I was just at a shop. They're printing on, they got a three auto shop. They're using Supercolor to do some pretty cool gradient work. Next up, Graphics Source. Thank you, Graphics, for sponsoring the podcast as well. Need a solution to improve efficiency and reduce costs in your art department? Graphics Source offers industry leading outsourcing options for your shop by truly becoming a part of the team. They plug and play, managing separations, mock up, creative, order entry, digitizing, and really good customer service. I know you're a big graphics customer. Um, and by the way, real quick, if you mentioned Printable Podcast as well, you get 50% off your first separation or digitizing order. So that is super cool. Um, they have been great and they plug right into your Printable account. Like they know what to do, they know how to set it up, and they're ready to go. Bruce, have you heard of Multicraft Daddy? If no. you need ink, supplies, or a daddy, follow Dave Eggers, Multicraft underscore daddy on Instagram. Um, Multicraft screen printing and digital supplies for over 50 years provides you with top brands at competitive prices. Mention the Printavo podcast and receive an extra 10% off your order. Thanks, Multicraft. So many deals. Last but not least, Easy Way. You shouldn't be spending all day cleaning dirty screens. Easy Way's line of environmentally conscious chemicals will get the job done faster, more efficiently, and will cost you a fraction of the cost per screen. If you're looking for any of these services, absolutely reach out to try these folks. These are hand selected. They are sponsoring the industry to help push this space forward. So we're really happy to be able to work with them and uh, they appreciate your support too. All right, let's jump into the pod. All right, Mr. Solomon, we're excited Hello. because you're certified, you're Six Sigma, you know screen printing, um, and your son but, is the legend of water-based printing, <laughs> Eric, Eric Solomon. Solomon what? What? Okay, because like we can't have a podcast with Eric's dad without asking about how what Eric was like. Yeah, growing up, was he medicine? What, what, what was Eric like in high school? Well, you know that's a real good one because he went to high school in Switzerland. Uh, oh. We were living overseas at the time, and so he was on his own in boarding school and. Uh, he was all over the place. Huh. And then he like secretly was screen printing like in the dorms and. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think he was screen printing back then. He was he was putting together bands and and shows in the school and uh, you know, figuring out how to put together, a, you know, like a sound stage. And he, he was just kind of becoming that little entrepreneur that he is now and um, learning what to do. So what, what, what was it like when Eric said, like, I'm going to start a screen printing business? Because I, I had a conversation with my dad at some point that I was like, I'm going and I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm just really curious. <laughs> yeah, it, w- it was really funny because um, he wanted to go to college to study music. And he spent, I think, like six months in, where was he, in Hartford, Hartford University. And then he said, no, nah, I don't want to do this. So. He came back and said, yeah, I want to do screen printing. Um, 
can I buy some equipment and move it into your garage? <laughs> well, okay, but that really turned out to me buying him equipment and him working in the garage and you know, washing out screens in my kitchen. And, you know, that went on for a little while. It was, it was interesting. And then we said to him and Val, said, yeah, why don't you go find a place? <laughs> That's pretty funny. It was getting ink everywhere in the kitchen or on the table. No, nah, they were pretty good about it. But uh, there was there was not one inch of space in the garage. You had to climb over equipment to get to one spot to another. And it, it was it was really funny. But they were they were having a good time and learning. And And from seeing Eric now to like when he was doing that and you were watching him in the garage. Did you ever imagine Night Owl would be what it is today? Like, what what were your thoughts? Like, oh, this is just going to like, this will be another hobby for him. Like, what did you think as a father figure watching your son screen print in, his, in your garage? Yeah, well, you're, you're right. I thought it was just going to be a hobby. But, you know, he and Val, uh, you know, they continued to grow and they moved from the garage to a small little warehouse. And they bought more equipment and they were, they were making money. They were, you know, they weren't greatly successful he's still living in the house but you know they they just kind of continued to expand moving from one bigger shop to another and you know we helped them out however we could but he and val you know did a great job building up the business and it's like i'm not sure where they're going to end up because you know they got a seventeen thousand square foot facility now and it's like my garage it's packed you know completely with equipment that's Screen awesome. Pre- supportive parents, we appreciate it. Wait, what did your parents say, Farrak, when you were like, "This is what uh, this is what I want to be doing"? Well, I like went to school for engineering. Conservative parents. My sister's doctor and lawyer, and then I started selling shirts. <laughs> and uh, I think they realized at some point I was going to black sheep a little bit. So they're like, "Well, if he's going to take a turn, we might as well make it something that." Uh, that he could be good at. And my parents actually helped me a bunch. Um, my dad came down with me and met with, you know, Tom and Jed and, um, they're super supportive. I think all parents are, you know, they they want your, they want, I don't know, maybe Kevin, this is from your standpoint, but we can mess up a little bit. Some of us will turn out. Okay. (laughs) No, I think that's exactly right. You know, yeah, I I think as, as a kid, I know I messed up quite a bit. So Kevin, um, we could talk about Eric all day, which could be a lot of fun, and um, I'm sure listeners would love to hear it. And if you don't follow Night Owl Printing, their stuff's incredible. Give us, you know, we brought you on today because we've been chatting a little bit and just a bunch of really interesting things from your background. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So, you know, I went to school. I I graduated. I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, Went to work for the oil industry. And, uh, and kind of traveled all over the world with them. Uh, but about 2000, I picked up this idea of um, Lean Six Sigma. And uh, we were overseas in Indonesia, and it was like, wow, this is what we need. And we had a, a huge workforce that was, you know, they were functional. We were make the company was making a huge amount of money back in the, in the 90s in the oil business. But we were very inefficient. And this idea came along about Six Sigma. And I said, wow, this is the methodology that we need to help our business be more efficient. So, you know, we learned, I learned that, became a green belt. And and for some reason, uh, this quality movement of Lean Sigma follows the karate type of mentality with, you know, white belts, yellow belts, green belts, and then, you know, black belts. And so I continued along just really learning. It, it was a natural progression for engineering and based on data and statistics. So it just uh, fell into place and worked really well. We were able to improve our operations greatly. Who, who injured? Go ahead, Bruce. But where's green in the, in the, is that the highest? Well, you know. Middle? I think it's all a bunch of baloney. Uh, actually, with this <laughs> belt, <laughs> so it's just like you know, I have a, a certification as a master black belt, which just means I know enough to be able to teach other people. 
And, you know, I've completed a lot of projects and, you know, I've trained quite a number, probably over a hundred different individuals on how to use this methodology as, as part of their business. So, you know, I think those are the only two. To what designate. happened at the oil and gas company when you when you got certified? Like what kind of improvements were you able to make there? A lot of them were focused on either maintenance, how do we keep uh, equipment running longer, and how do we schedule maintenance so that the equipment's down less. And then a lot of projects on increasing production, looking for what, what causes us to be inefficient, to, you know, and not produce enough oil as we should be. Um, and then a lot of it was also like back office work. You know, how do we do our, you know, our reconciliation of accounting practices better? So we do that faster. How do we look at, you know, our hiring process? You know, everything is related to just doing things uh, simpler, quicker, faster, and cheaper. So it wasn't even just the like production of oil or whatever that process was. It was literally every department uh, of, of becoming more lean. Kevin, did, did the company like uh, pay for you to go to this? Like when you first got, did, did, was there a boss or a mentor of yours that like said, hey, you should try this? Was it on your own? Tell us about that. Yeah, it was actually uh, our vice president of operations. You know, when, when uh, the expats go overseas, we go over there to help bring knowledge to the local engineers and, uh, and people there from, you know, we bring it for the States to the local, in this case, Indonesians. Um, who are always eager to lead. And my, we brought this to my vice president and said, you know, we think this is a good methodology that provides discipline and a, you know, very clear process improvement methodology. It's very stepwise. And it, it just seemed like a natural fit. So they did actually even better than paying for me to go. They brought consultants overseas to us, you know, and so they would come, you know, like, uh, I think they came like every six months or something like that and taught us and did some mentoring. So they they made a pretty big investment into you, you all. And then you turned that around and saved them millions and millions and millions of dollars. Yep, exactly. Uh, you know, the last count when we when I left that company, probably around 2016, it was well over several hundred million dollars that this process has been able to, to save them or to help increase, you know, revenue. What was, uh, do you remember an example project, even just like one specific, it could be any department that, that you applied this to and changed the game? Yeah, there, there, are, there are so many. Um, one of them was, um, they were always so eager to drill new wells. Uh, but the infrastructure was never there. So, you know, you bring on new wells, that fluid has to go into pipes. Um, as you start to, just like anything, as you start to add more and more volume of fluid into a fixed size pipe, it starts to choke down. So, you know, we, we looked at the process that we were doing and, and how they were thinking about where they put new wells and getting them to realize that one, they need to plan on new infrastructure as well. And then, then we started talking to some chemical manufacturers about uh, how do we reduce viscosity of, of the liquid? And we found some viscosity enhancing uh, products that helped us basically stuff more fluid in the pipe. Uh, so that was a huge dollar save. I mean, we spent probably 20 to $30 million a year in this chemical, but we produced about $200 million a year more oil. So where do you like, okay, you've got a business that's so big, where do you start to look for improvements? So, cause I was reading, I read through the, the two second lean book. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it or read it, um, you know, and they talk about, you have to get your whole team thinking about improvements whether small or large and writing them down and meeting on them and like recording them to acknowledge accomplishments and this and that but even like bigger than that right there's all of this are, are managers surfacing these ideas to the 
to your team and then you guys go and sort what any kind of improvements or where do you start? Well, you start with, um, you know, people like you guys, like Steven, that, you know, you have a business, you know, it's not perfect. You know, you got problems, um, but you, you're just so busy. You don't have time to tackle them on your own. Right. You know, that, that's Eric. You know, he's down on the production floor doing the work. Um, but, you know, there's some issues. And so that's where a lot of these ideas come from. They come from the managers. They come from the, you know, the executives. But they also come from people on the floor that say, hey, I, you know, I, I know this is inefficient. How could I do it better? And they just don't have the structured methodology to try to solve the problem or the time. So, you know, it, it's a combination of different approaches that allow us to to see, uh, you know, some improvements, identify problems. And but how do you get the team thinking about that? Like, And maybe Farrag in your shop too, like how do you, you know, say, hey guys, instead of just doing what you're doing every day, like observe to be curious about this stuff that's happening. Well, I'll just like be vulnerable for a second. We were starting to talk to Kevin and we're trying to figure out and, and, we're too busy right now. And we're tr we literally like that same thing happened. We got really busy. And, you know, while we had downtime, we started thinking about it and we're all like, okay, like we all want to do this. And we started and then shit hit the fan. And then we put off doing it. And now it's like, we, we're going to do it in the summer. We're doing it. Um, but I think what I struggled with is trying to get the right. Cause like, there's a level of aptitude and intelligence necessary to at least put the framework in for it. And I'm my biggest concern is like employee adoption, not from a management standpoint, but like getting three or four people that really want to like put their arms around it. Right. Like that. How do you in, in a in a small business now in a big business with mechanical engineers and bachelor degrees and like, uh, you know, maybe a probably a, a little bit different of like academic acumen for this stuff. How do you instill that in maybe a smaller business where it's more like skilled labor and, and, and not necessarily the like strategic mathematical thinkers like. Yeah, that's, that's a really good, good question, Stephen. And, you know, I, I think us back to um, where lean started, lean started in the Toyota, production system. That's what they called it. It was never called lean. Um, and it started at the factory floor by the people who were putting together cars. And the intent was that the, the entire workforce looks every job that they do and they try to make small incremental improvements. So you have to make it a business strategy. You have to get everybody on board to go, we're going to do this. And the benefits are going to be you're going to work easier. You're going to work more efficient. The company is going to do better. We're going to make more money by increasing revenue or decreasing costs. And, and you start to have these communications. You, you just can't go, OK, we're going to solve problems. You have to get a team approach. And the team is the people that work every day on their jobs. And you get them to see. I can do this a little bit easier. And that's how you get the buy-in because you have to have that buy-in. Is there like tactical things too? Like are there weekly, you know, cause I remember when we implemented the traction method of the scorecard and stuff, it probably took a couple months of just like talking about the numbers again and again and again, until people started to come to the meeting prepared with things to improve their department numbers is that sort of similar where hey guys all right 10 minutes any ideas of things that you want to be able to improve that we can think about okay probably nothing the first meeting probably nothing the second meeting but but still bring it up or like posters or yeah you know that that stuff there, there has to be like a circus leader right yeah there's there's got to be a cheerleader somebody's got to you know, lead the effort. And, and you're going to also find uh, the opposite is there too. Well, uh, I don't know how to best say this. We call them cave dwellers. 
uh, people that don't want to come out of the cave at all I'll say you'll never improve things. Uh, and you have to start to just kind of win them over by showing them, you know, here, here's what we can do. And you have to start with, with data in, in a way. You can't improve a process if you can't measure it, right? So you got to be able to track performance. You have to have a baseline and then make some changes and go, okay, yeah, I see with data that, you know, our, our setup time is down. We're, we're more efficient. Uh, downtime overall uh, on, a, on a screen printing press is down. Well, well, what did we do? You know, and, and make those just small incremental improvements, and everybody starts to see it and they feel it and go, "Yeah, let me keep doing this." Have you? Do you feel like you started that culture, Farrag, or is like where, where do well, you feel like you're at? My problem right now is I'm very torn in several different places because we're scaling sales as hard as we can. And then I go down into production and I've got two days with them and then I'm back up and then I'm back down. And so like, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to make sure we have the leadership team in place to really implement it. And that's, that's what we're struggling with right now is finding the middle managers that I can sit in a boardroom with and say like, what are the you know, what are the changes that we made last week and what are we going to do this? Because it's like you're almost gamifying getting better. It's like it's it's got to be not a contest, right? But like this 1% improvement every single day. Um, I guess like, Kevin, if a shop, you know, like they're going to be hearing this and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, I I need this. I You know, like what what advice do you have for the shop that feels helpless of like, where do I even start? How do I even, my employees can barely show up to work, you know, um, whatever. I can't find employees. Like what advice do you have for those shops and those maybe one or two auto shops? Yeah, that, that is one of the biggest problems I know that Eric's running into. Where do I find uh, employees that are t either talented or at least know the screen printing business? And uh, it's very difficult. Um, what you have to do is at least find employees that are excited about learning uh, and then finding the leaders. So it becomes, it does become very difficult uh, to find those people, but you always want to try to instill this idea of, at least that's what I've tried to do is I can, I can do my job better. I can do it simpler. And you have to have leaders. I mean, Eric's struggling with that right now. How do we get you know, our production manager really focused on leading the whole effort? How do we get the production coordinators um, in place so that you know, they're bringing the next job to the press so that our press operators can just print the shirts? And then how do you start to cross train them? So you have to have that clear setup, um, that kind of organization uh, discipline and skills in place. And I think Steve, it sounds like that's where you're kind of working towards as well. Yeah. I think the the struggle that I have is like, there's too many people in our shop that are multitaskers. Like, you know, the person that burned the screens might be the person that's doing this. And like that person might be doing this and this. And so sometimes it feels tough to try to like create those very narrow channels, but then you're like, oh, can you go heat seal that real quick and cut vinyl and, and do this? I don't know. I, is, I don't know, Kevin, if that's it at Night Owl, if there's a lot of, or if maybe you've seen the progression from multitaskers to like niche specific positions. Yeah, we, we are exactly, we're trying to move in that way because, you know, multitasking is a great thought. Uh, but let's be honest, I mean, it's better to do one task really well than a whole bunch of tasks kind of, you know, half-assed, if you would. <laughs> and so we're trying to get them to have very clear roles and responsibilities. And, it, and it's another fine line between, right, I can't hire everybody that I possibly need. How do I afford that based on my current revenue streams? Uh, the ideal would be you have all these people in place, but... You may not be a, a small shop, may not be able to handle that. So you have to have multitasking, but you have to do it, you know, very efficiently as best as you can. So where do you start? So you've got, let's say, you know, you, you've got a motivated production manager, somebody to champion it. That's clearly key. Number one, somebody has to really push it forward. 
I kind of wonder, is there a way financially to do it? But I don't know if you can well, actually Well, let me ask it. you this. Can a shop owner champion it? Or do you think it needs to be like one of your employees championing it? I think like for you, Stephen, as an example, you have to say to your team, I think this is a good business strategy. We're going to try it. And I'm going to pass that on to one individual who's going to champion it. Maybe he's your production manager or uh, in Eric's case, we started with our fulfillment operation. Uh, we worked there, but that somebody other than you has to be the person really driving. It. You're the guy, you're the leader that says, this is our business strategy. I see the value in it. Joe, go make it work. <laughs> and then he's got to decide, where do I think I can make the biggest impact? Who's who on my team? is excited about doing this, and then let's try. There's a couple of approaches that, that we've used, and they're both different. One is where you find a problem, you get the people together, and you solve the whole thing and implement it. And that takes some time and effort. You can't just solve it typically in a day. Um, because the other thing I preach is, if you know the answer, you should just do it, implement it, right? You don't need to have a big, long, six sigma project to figure out the solution. Uh, but the problems that are more difficult, uh, you want to take a little bit of time. But the other thing you can do is make a change and see what happens. Ah, that was positive. Let me let me make a, a little more change. Ah, we, we call that kind of an agile approach. We make small incremental improvements. Um, and if you fail on one, you haven't lost a great deal but you've been able to try to motivate the people into I'm empowered to make changes and to do things better. Okay. Now, when do you think it's the best time to be able to start looking uh, at this? Is it a revenue size? You think like at a million bucks? Okay. Now you're probably starting to have waste that you can begin to look to eliminate. Every business has waste. Now, uh, you know, it's, it's one you, you, it just kind of put things together. You know, Stephen, maybe you, you've done that as well, building your your business up. Uh, you find things that work and you just stick with them. Um, how do you train people on the, or the right way to do this? So, you know, it probably doesn't make sense to really look at it from um, a mom and pop or a small one manual press operation. But once you start to get to, you know, a number of employees, you know, you get the 10, 20, uh, and we're certainly larger. I think that's the opportunity where you can start to make some true improvements on increasing profits and reducing costs. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So maybe it's like the, that uh, kind of 10 person mark and above that you start to look for. Is there, so, you know, two second lean really talked about the focus of waste and waste could be money waste, items waste, or a lot of the time it was just time waste. Is that a good way of sorting through improvements to say where are where is a like all the waste and listing them out and kind of sorting them by most waste to least waste to begin the process? That, that's that's a good question and it's a good thought. Um, what Lean has done is to quantify what waste is. You know, what, is, what does waste really mean? It means something different to other, lots of people. Um, so we kind of look at it at eight different ways. We look at defects. You know, am I, am I producing uh, a shirt where we're not actually uh, meeting the customer's requirements on what the design looks like? Uh, do I pr overproduce? Do I make more than necessary? Uh, am I waiting around? Am I not using my people well? Then transportation, do I move material all over the place? Uh, inventory, do I stock a lot of inventory? And then there's, there's waste of motion uh, where I may have to have somebody at the press run to the ink room and then run to the screen room and then run back, you know. And then there's an, another waste that we call over-processing. Do I, do I make the product? better than what the customer wants. So we've classified it into these eight ways. So we can start to talk about them a little bit more clearly. 
And then once you can see the type of waste, it's easier to remove it. Because the one thing that we always preach is, is value. There's value and then there's non-value work. The customer only wants to pay for value added work. So in their mind, probably the only thing that's value added is when the press is making my, you know, t-shirt, my hoodie or whatever. They're not interested in your setup time or your tear down time or the time to make the screens or the time it takes for your back office to process their invoices. They only are interested in making my product. So we have to keep that in mind and to, the way that we look at it is let's look at non-value added steps and let's look at this these eight waste categories. So once we understand what those are, we can see them easier. And the key to all of this is, uh, Stephen, I'm sure you're there, you do this all the time, you go look. You go down to the production floor and you watch what's going on. And then you shake your head and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes you, just, you do. Um, or you wait till the shop closes down and you uh, pull a hurricane through it, and next day everyone's like, hurricane hey, this is, that's Hurricane Steven. But even, even like uh, wasting time, you know, I even think about like artwork. Like how much time is wasted in back and forth? Like I know yeah, we could talk about ink waste and press and that, but like, you know, you kind of talk about that non value add of like, all the stuff that happens before the job, you know, like Andy on shirt show the other day was talking about text message approvals for art and how that's just reduced how many extra emails he has to send um, and, and cutting that stuff out. And I think there's, there's so much before the shirt even gets printed where like waste can be reduced um, just even customer communication, right? Like it doesn't have to be physical like manufacturing and stuff, right? That's right. You know, we're, we're actually working on that at Night Owls is the approval times, whether it's the customer approving the artwork and like you say, emails, I mean, it takes forever. Uh, or even down on the factory floor, you know, once you get everything set up, you run through the first test. Now somebody's got to approve it and make sure that it's correct. It meets the color standards. How do you reduce that time to you know, almost nothing. So, so like at Night Owl, was Eric always measuring stuff or did he have to reteach himself to start measuring? Because like. Yeah, we, we, we weren't measuring anything. <laughs> OK. And so we've we've started to implement some uh, some tools to help us, you know, capture that time. So like I, I bet a bunch of shops listening to this are being like, I don't measure anything. Right. Like I just did we print a lot today? good does it look like we printed a lot what would you Indoors say just don't have the time to do it either. or they don't have the time what would you say are like the three or four things because you kind of said you can't can't make an improvement if you don't measure it but i bet you a lot of shops listening to this aren't measuring anything like on the floor what would you say are like the three or four things that you have to be measuring every single day and, and we're focusing a lot at night i was on the production floor right now um you got to be able to measure setup time. You have to be able to measure approval time on the floor, you know, um, and then just total downtime because there's there's time in between all the work that you're doing where nothing is going on. You know, so in my mind and what I'm trying to get everybody to understand is the only time you're really uh, doing any value added work is when the, the press is running and you're cranking out the, the shirts. Um, everything else, we have to figure out how to shrink that down. So those are the key ones. And I know Bruce, right, Printavo is coming up with some measurement systems that uh, can help screen printers to, to measure their work. There's a few others that are out there. It, it doesn't matter what you use. You just have to start measuring. You know, My guess is the defects aren't too bad. They're probably in your shop. Uh, oh, Steven. we got them. <laughs> yeah, everybody's got them, but um, hopefully they're not at uh, the ten percent level. <laughs> no, no, but but spoilage in a contract shop, right? Um, you know, I think I think every shop is going to be a little bit different. You know, Ryan Kasperian, who uh, is is a, a industry consultant, has started going to a lot of shops, 
And he literally gets paper and clipboard out and is like, do this for the first two weeks. And then we'll start entering it in. And sure enough, like they're writing stuff down on clipboards. Um, I don't know if they're making them into spreadsheets yet, but we're measuring them, you know. So so you said like downtime. What else should you be measuring in your shop? Like I said, uh, setup time, how long it takes for you to do the setup. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to also measure true production time. Uh, that's always just good to know how many shirts, you know, we're trying to get to or how many shirts per minute do you uh, do you make? Uh, a lot of a lot of people are using kind of like this sawtooth method. I know uh, Mark Coudre's talked about that quite a bit of uh, pricing, you know, but, but once you start to truly know how many uh, impressions you're making, which is another measurement that you will want to see how many how many screens you're actually using. And then once you start to know that, you, you can try to develop a better pricing strategy as well. I, I usually start uh, and believe in the keep it simple, stupid method, right? Yes. So going down, watching with a clipboard and just writing down uh, how long it takes for each of these steps is a simple way to get started. You don't need any big sophisticated program. Um, you know, just the clipboard is, and, is just written out. Do you get your employees to measure their own time? How no, do you? I go down there. Got you. So you physically are there doing it yourself. Like there's there's a manager that's actually measuring it. Somebody, yeah. I mean, because just think about it. You don't you don't really want them to stop their work, right? I mean, you don't have excess people just hanging around. Mm -hmm. uh, the people on your production floor, they're busy. Right. They're probably overly busy. So, you know, if if it's a first event, I'll go there um, and then then we'll try to get, you know, like somebody like maybe Jason or, you know, I try to get Eric to do it. He told me no way. <laughs> that, that's like an awkward thing to do, but like to actually sit there and watch it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you got to sit there. Yeah. You got to sit there and explain to people. I'm not looking at your job i'm not out to get you i just gathering data gathering knowledge because uh, and then there's there's this other thing so it's a horthon effect horthon was a, a famous psychologist who said you know what happens people go down there they watch you work what happens you do a better job because you're going oh i'm being watched i better i better do a good job so you know you got to do it fairly regularly so that it becomes just commonplace and then you get the true, the true data. Yeah. I think for us, you know, my whole thing is like our press is spinning or our press is not spinning. MNR, Rock, Anatol, if you're hearing this, that's the data that we need. <laughs> um, <laughs> because literally I've like, I, you know, is the press spinning? Like, is the press spinning? Um, and it's, it's a damn shame that the industry hasn't come out with that yet. Um, because like it's 2022 and I, you know, I can, I can pull my car out from my phone, but my presses still have no like measurement of data. Bruce, you've, you've been talking to them a little bit. What do you think the holdup is in the industry of like manufacturers not, cause I mean, I know Eric and I chat about this quite a bit of like equipment, not giving you good feedback. We, I, yeah, we've chatted with quite a, almost all of them. Um, and everybody is aware that their customers are asking for it. I think the thing, though, is just priority of stuff to do. And their view, I think, is that nobody has come out with it. And so I don't need to be competitive yet and to 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 higher prioritize something like that. There was a bit of a worry of how would it even work and could it be hacked? And is that a safety issue? I know early on, but yeah, I don't know. We, we just had another conversation recently where there's interest. I even just said, if you created some sort of open API, API. somehow mm -hmm. and to let people just start building. But you know, the, the tricky part is it would be like asking us to create hardware. It'd be like, because they work on hardware, but they don't work on really software. And so now you, you have to hire or figure out how to do that stuff. I didn't have an appreciation for making that transition, but uh, yeah. But you, guys, I mean, but you do have an API, and when you built Printavo, you built it with an API. Because, right, but it and, would and, be like us like building a device 
It would be like, you know, could, you know, cause they, they're great at building physical things and sure there's software components to it, but they're not web based engineering, which I, when I talked to them more, they were like, they didn't understand how that worked and what their best practice is, which I was like, whoa, you guys are so smart. But it was just a totally different type of engineering, which then, I, I, you know, you start to get it. But I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully soon. I know they're all, you know, I think one person needs to spearhead it <laughs> for, uh, that's, you know, that's your, your public I thought announcement. Like, can you, can someone build an aftermarket Raspberry Pi? I have one around here with a sensor on the bottom and you can count like, and you could graph when your press is running, right? And then it would go down when the press wasn't running and then you'd at least chart it. Like, that's all I want to know. Is my press spinning? Um, because like I showed you this, Bruce, like our downtime is so bad. <laughs> like setup times and downtime. It's, I don't even want to know what the percentage of downtime is, but like, if we could, if we could decrease, like decrease that by ten or fifteen percent, I bet you if we could do ten minutes an hour, five minutes an hour, like we we'd print, you know, so many more shirts. Sorry, manufacturers, if you're listening to this, um, do something about it. Reach out to your rep to get it done. Reach out to your rep. Tell tell them the brats from Printavo sent you. <laughs> but you, you're, you know, you guys are exactly right. Uh, first. The, the manufacturers of the screen printing business, that's not their core business, right? So right. They just want to build machines and turn them out. But you have to have this data. And there are some systems out there, you know, we're using one that... that I think, I think Marshall's good, made you, one, right, Bruce? Yeah. Yeah. He's got one. Yeah, you got to enter in a lot of data and then out comes uh, charting. Some, some cool stuff, actually. Just search uh, production um, workflow. Tracker. Print, or production tracker, yeah, Printavo, and you'll see a video that Allie, um, when she was running her shop, set up. It's kind of cool. I mean, if you take the time to enter in all that info, it is pretty cool. You know, so are there easy wins, Kevin, to, you know, if somebody's just getting started as well, which most are, is it, you know, okay, hey, look, I've seen the biggest issues are in these two or three areas. And here's what you can do to be able to help improve that this week. There are some, um, but every business is just a little different. And so that's why I like to sit down with the individuals, you know, with Stephen. What do you think your biggest problems are? You guys know better than me about your business, but I can help you to uh, utilize some of this methodology, train your people. Cause you know, I like to use the, the old adage, you know, if I give you a fish, you eat for today. Right. But if I teach you to fish, you eat forever. And so I, I want to train you guys to use this as a methodology so that you take care of it yourself eventually, just the way you do business. You know, I think Steven mentioned it. The biggest thing is how do I get my presses spinning more? And that's usually the first one I look at. I think one of the most important parts of this, whether you're implementing traction or profit forced or, you know, any of these systems is like enrolling yourself into something and then having a mentor or a coach. So like what we're going to be doing is um, like enrolling in the curriculum, right, Kevin, there's like an actual like certification. And then on top of that, having someone to hold us accountable and handhold us, which would be Kevin. Um, and I think that's, that's really important because like, I don't, I don't know if you've met many people that can just do it by themselves. Are there, maybe there's lean self starters out there, but like, it's definitely not easy. It's like just starting to go to the gym again, you know? But is there maybe one good thing? Maybe, maybe this comes from Night Owl, which, you know, you saw a pretty clear improvement after that you can share, uh, after making a change. Yeah, we, um, it had nothing to do with screen printing. You know, Night Owls has a fulfillment uh, business as well. And when I first started you know, working with them, they had material and merchandise all over the place. It was somewhat organized, but not really. There was always stuff in boxes. You know, some boxes were over there and some boxes were way over there. People were tripping over one another. So what we came and did, we looked at it in terms of flow. How should the flow be and how should merchandise be organized? We actually 
modeled it off of another shop uh, called Hello Merch. Um, it, that's usually the best way to go figure out a solution is talk to other people, see what other people are doing. And that's where, you know, people like me who are consultants that go to a lot of shops that we bring back the best of, of each one. So we modeled our uh, fulfillment operation af somewhat after them, created a, a more lean um, and systematic flow where you know, people weren't just stepping over each other. We knew where every piece of merchandise was. It was organized. We had it knew the inventory amounts, and it took it took a while, to be honest, because we had to redo the whole fulfillment department. Uh, but our fulfillment manager and his assistant manager and our team, they worked pretty much uh, tirelessly for um, about probably more than a month, including some late nights and weekends. But we got it organized, so, and it was looking at wasted motion. It was looking at inventory, and, and understanding how to how to really streamline that whole operation. And it's much more efficient. We're probably we. The goal is never to eliminate positions, but it's how do you how do you work with fewer people, uh, and then move those people to jobs or locations that need the you need the extra help. And so we're much more efficient there now. As a matter of fact, we're so efficient, we've got new customers. I don't have any place to put more merchandise anymore. Yeah. I think what's interesting is watching Eric do it. He was on this discovery for the software, whether it was like a WMS, and he would be like, I'm on a demo with this one. I'm trying this one out. But like, I think what, what's very interesting about Night Owl is like they're not afraid to try with the intention that you might fail. And it's just an iterative process of like lots of little experiments. And I think that's like something that I see in shops as like, they're so scared to just try because they think they have to make the right decision the first time. Like Bruce, you'll see this at people at trade shows, like I will not use QuickBooks online. And you're like, okay, it's 2022. But like, have you tried a different way? Are you willing to try? And there's a lot of people out there that they think that you have to find the perfect solution on your first shot. And that's just so far from the truth. Um, and that's why, like, I see Night Owl with, like, the new heat press that Kev that Eric's starting to push now, right? Like, iterating, iterating, iterating. It's so cool, the stuff that's going on down there. Um, I don't know, Bruce, do you see that, like, those two kind of mindsets? Yeah, you're, yeah I, think you're, I think you're right. It's just, like, just, just starting somewhere. But it is it is overwhelming. Like even sometimes I think about a, like everything that has to be done and, and you know my task list and everything. Else. And it's just like how would I even add this into my schedule? But it is for sure of just start somewhere with little things. Whenever but when anybody starts at Printavo, I talk about the uh, the theory of we try to do just one percent improvements every day. So like if you see something, try to document the process, put it into the folders. Here's where it is. If you um, so you something that's slow, bring it up. And then what I, I try to acknowledge them in like Slack, which is, you know, we're remote. So that's where everybody is. It's like, oh my gosh, look what somebody, you know, documented. This is so cool to try to push the positive habits. Um, it doesn't happen often, I'd say, but I definitely see there's a handful of people that like, do embrace it and i and then i'm like okay i'm gonna spend more time with them to encourage them versus try to boil the ocean with everybody um and like thank you for doing that things like that but uh or or what i found too is asking for their feedback on stuff and then i found to encourage people like hey what do you think about this? something that's like way above probably what they're responsible for like a commission plan like what do you think how do are we need to motivate this behavior what, what could this look like? But, you know, this is really interesting, Kevin. So like you've got, okay, so there's the eight forms of waste, which you talked about too. And then there's, to wrap up to, there's the five S's, right? Which is um, how to solve that. Can you touch on, on that for folks so that they can use that methodology to go after these waste points? Five, five S's is, is a little different than that. Uh, five oh. S's. Is, is basically an, an organization type of uh, activity. It, I never, I honestly, I never remember what all five S's are, but it has to do with cleaning up your workplace, 
that everything has its own place, that you, or everything is always in its place, and that you have a method for sustaining that. Because all of this has to come back to, hey, we make these little changes, like we said, or maybe they're big changes. How do I make it stick? So, so we have the eight ways which help us to identify where some of these problems are. Because now that I put them in little buckets, I can see them easier. And then once I can see them, I can solve them. And 5S is a way of organizing the workplace so that I know I can always go and find um, the item I'm looking for. I mean, how many of us have toolboxes in our garage and you, you spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes looking for the right drill bit or the right wrench. But if you have it organized in such a way, I can go to that toolbox, find that wrench instantly. And that's what we kind of did with um, our, our Night Owls Fulfillment, is that if I'm looking for one t-shirt design, I know exactly where it is. You know, I know where the smalls are, the mediums are, the larges are, and I can go put my hand on it in, in just a minute. Um, so that's what 5S helps you to do, organize it. But just to get back to what you were talking about, I think that you gentlemen, as leaders of your company, that's what you need to do is inspire and coach and, and reward people that show this initiative, you know, to help make these improvements. It doesn't take any great deal of, uh, of training or knowledge. It just takes a desire to make things better. And for somebody to come up at the end of the day and go, good job. Thank you. Kevin Solomon, how do people reach you if they want to work with you, consult, learn? Yeah, I've got uh, my little uh, email. It's uh, ks.strategies at gmail. Right. Send me a note. Yeah, I'd love to help you guys to teach you how to fish. That's the whole intent. Well, this is this is awesome. I think it's just really special seeing that you've seen the industry and, and seen, you know, Eric grow with it. And then being able to take this approach there, there's just like so much knowledge there. So we'll have to do this again. So this yeah, awesome. this was great. Yeah, I'm really very proud of Eric and Val. They've, they've created a business that is much bigger than I ever envisioned. And I have a feeling it's going to, Stephen and, uh, and Bruce, just like your business, is going to continue to grow and you'll do well. And I'm going to help you make uh, some minor improvements that are going to increase profits tremendously. Cool. There we well, go. Thank you it's so Kevin much. Solomon. Thanks so much for joining on. Bruce thank from Printavo, Stephen from Campusing. Thanks for listening to the Printavo Pronouncers podcast. We'll see you on the next episode.